the traditional way of viewing a project is this triangle which you try to keep in balance. So basically, if you have an event that happens at a certain time, you say you need to be off-site or you need to run a conference or you need to run an engagement thing, you can't change that end time. The only thing that you can do is, um, I can see Hannah now, is that okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the only thing that you can do is alter the cost, the amount of resources you're putting in, or you reduce the scope, the amount of work that you're doing. You say, for example, actually we're not going to have that poster, or we're going to reduce the number of posters we've got, or do other things. So that's kind of the traditional way of looking at a project, basically concentrating on the inputs. What the public value framework does is look at what you're putting in, which is the program project um, funding, and what you are getting out um, at the end, the outputs and the outcomes. And it's based on what they call these four pillars. And you can kind of see it almost as a project temple as opposed to a project um, triangle, where these, these pillars basically support the project overall. And what you're looking at is to maximize what comes out the other end. Um, what's really important here is that when thinking about how we use this, it's not about, gosh, that's a lot of resource, or it's not even about quantifying that resource. So basically what you're thinking about, you're not making a calculation on the quantity of the resource put in, you're looking at the quality of what comes out the other end. And it's a mechanism to think about how you're using that resource to best effect. And then what you can do in order to evaluate a project to see if it actually works across those four pillars is to basically do a RAG report, a red, amber, green, on each of the four pillars. And it may be by thinking about the project in this way. You don't need to basically change what you're putting in, but you can tweak it to make sure that you have a better public benefit or you can develop capacity more or you can do other things that can tweak your project but don't necessarily um, cost that much more to do. But at the same time, you also need to measure and have a way of measuring what you're actually producing. Um, so to give a kind of example of what you might do. So, if we're thinking about a project and we're thinking about the products at the end and you're thinking about, well, what would the thing that we could do is produce an article in a high impact journal. Now, that might benefit the researchers and the people who are carrying out the project and the peers, if you like, but if it's not open access, it's gonna have limited, act, limited impact. If it's not accessible um, in some form or the data is not accessible, then you can't reuse that data. So you're reducing your public benefit and you're reducing the impact of the work that you're doing. But if you then think, well, we could do an article, but we could also make sure that we deposit the data with the ADS in a way, for example, that it's available to everybody. And then we also, say, have a website where we basically um, give a summary of the results um, for the public audience. That may be a better way of doing it. But then if we're thinking maybe about the traditional things that we might do outreach, so say, um, talking to a local society. It's then about the um, number of the audience that you reach. So, and it might be a traditional audience that you reach um, because they're likely to be an older population. They're likely um, to basically have a lot of spare time, say if you're doing it in the evening. Um, so you're going to reach a, a relatively small segment of the audience and we'll be talking about audience participation and, and kind of engaging your audience later. Um, on, how to get to those difficult to reach audiences. But then if you think, for example, that you um, then, for example, live stream that, or you record that, that talk to the local society, and then you put it on a website or you make it available, suddenly the impact of the resource that you've put in, which is the same resource with just a little tweak maybe, then has a much wider impact. And that's the kind of thing that the public value framework helps you think about 
by thinking about these questions. So if we go back to the pillars a bit, um, what the pillars actually do is, is kind of break it down into different things. And this assured alignment, um, clarity of goals, which is kind of the main project, what are you trying to do? Who are you trying to do it for? You know, what's the actual purpose of your project or program? So that's the main thing. And then underneath these, there are some other um, questions that you can ask. So for example, how might this particular project address a regional research framework question? How might this feed into what you know about the archaeology of a particular place based on previous research? So it kind of allows you to link with other work that you might have done and also maybe connect with other areas, say um, a research project that might be going on in a university or, or um, thinking about what the local society might be doing or thinking about what other people might be doing. For example, like hedgerow survey been done by um, a natural history group, for example. Um, and this is where the pillars start to link into each other because one thing that we have at the end is basically that cross-boundary collaboration in our fourth pillar. It's about building those connections and by doing that, making the best value that you can out of, again, what you're putting in. Um, but, but still of this, you've still got to measure and you've still got to have um, good KPIs um, and you still need to think about um, the track record of what you're trying to do, which may mean that you need to think, do we need to do this in different ways? Um, one of the ideas between, between public value frameworks and thinking about projects is you bring, you have to approach it very openly and actually bringing in people who aren't experienced can give, really give you new insights because it's about not doing the same thing because we tend to do the same thing all the time, especially when you're experienced, you do the same thing again and again. If you have a placement student who sits with you on this and goes, actually, why do you do it that way? It makes you think, why do we do it that way? And is there another way that we can do it? But you might not get that insight if you didn't involve effectively, um, if you like, inexperienced people who will bring something really fresh. Um, there's this kind of exercise that you can do with spaghetti. I don't know whether you've done it. You have to build the toilet tire. And the people, the, basically, the people who do the best and build the toilet tire are the toddlers basically the nursery students. In all the exercises they've done with experts and everything else, it's the toddlers because they come in with no preconceived ideas about what the properties of spaghetti and marshmallows, even you do it with marshmallows as are, are. They just basically go for it and experiment without preconceived ideas. I've done this myself and we listened to the architect and we did okay, but we didn't go nearly as well as the people who were kind of more creative at it and just basically they won, basically, because they just approached it and went willy-nilly and just went, wow. So it, that's the kind of idea about what we're trying to do. It's a different way of looking at things. Um, what I'm not going to concentrate on, what we're not going to think about today, really, is appropriate resourcing. Because I know you all manage projects, and I, you know, that, we don't need to concentrate on that. That's kind of more of the traditional stuff that we do. And I don't want to treat my, teach my grandmother to suck eggs, as it were. Um, but what this is in, and something that, that is worth thinking about, you remember I talked about the awareness of the knock-on costs? That's that idea about transferring things from one thing to another, which is important to think about both kind of inside and outside projects. And that's also links into data management and how you deal with that from the start, and also how you're going to deal with your archiving. Because if you don't do it early on, you're going to pay for it later. Um, Oh, right, I'm about to finish. OK, so I'm just going to very quickly. So public support, it's about engaging on the user experience. Um, and in particular, the, the kind of the, the experience of the user, the experience of the stakeholder, that's really important in terms of how we influence things. And the fourth um, pillar, which we're going to talk quite a lot about, is how you develop the capacity. In other words, what's the legacy of that project both in terms of capability, um, both in terms of new technologies or disruptive innovation, which we'll hopefully talk about a bit more later, um, and in terms of that collaboration and the resilience of the business going forward. What are you doing in terms of training? 
What are you doing in terms of upskilling? So this all feeds into this idea of basically sustainability and long-term um, benefit for everyone. So I'll stop there because I realise I'm at the end. Right. Thank you.